This is Amateur Logic, episode 117, for May 15th, 2018. This episode of Amateur Logic was brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com, and by ICOM. Spring is in the air. Stay connected around the world with ICOM's D Star radios. Welcome to another exciting episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. Are you sure? Well, I had to think about it for a second, I'll be honest. I'm Tommy. I'm Peter. And I'm Emil. And, of course, it's great to be back as always. As uh, always. Boy, it has been a busy time around here, hasn't it? Uh, it has. That's kind of an understatement. See, last weekend, where did we go last weekend? Last weekend, we went back down south to Lafayette, Louisiana. To uh, Emil's stomping grounds. We did, and Emil wasn't stomping Except around We just there. did some stomping without <laughs> <Yeah>. him. <laughs> my, my kitty stomped back home, so I stayed home. Well, you know, I I thought that I did not like jambalaya, but that that whole experience changed my mind completely. Oh, it, it was so good. It was great, man. Really, really good. Uh, we did grows on you. Yeah. Uh, Delta Division D-Star Day. Yeah, triple Triple D plus one. Yeah, four Ds. Yeah, it it was um, well, it was a great event. You know, I learned a lot about D Star that I did not know. I mean, you know, there are several competing digital systems out there now, but if you're looking into doing MCOMs where they need to do a lot of data these days, uh, filing forms and stuff, it seems like somebody has sat down and figured all of this out. And oh yeah, they. They really covered it well. We've got a video posted on that short one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a five and a half hour video. I uh, reposted it. We uh, did a little cleanup on it. It was super long, so we cut out the lunch break and all that stuff and mm -hmm. trimmed, up, trimmed it down as much as possible. So there's five and a half hour video of the event on our YouTube channel. Yeah. The AmateurLogic.tv YouTube channel. So just, just uh, go to Amateur Logic on YouTube, search for it there. That You'll was fun it. uploading that thing too, yeah. man. What was the actual title you put on there? Uh, Triple D plus one, um, Delta Division D Star Day. So if they search for any of that, it'll probably it come should, up. It'll come up. It should. Okay. Cool. Well, that was that was certainly a lot of fun. And this weekend we're here. Next weekend we're going to be gone again. Yeah, store of my life. We'll be at Dayton in Dayton, Ohio. The biggest ham fest in the world. Hamvention. Hamvention. It's it's really going to be um, a fun time. I'm looking forward to it. This year, we're going to the flea market first. Okay. That's my plan. I'm going to hold you to that. Okay. All right. So uh, I didn't get a chance to see it last year, but this year. Yeah, you saw that's, it. That's Well, I did, but it you was from afar. You just didn't want to go through it. I didn't bring my boots, man. <laughs> but this that's, year. It's yeah, going to be different. I understand. Uh, heard from several people that they've got that problem corrected. If it were, if it happens yeah. to rain, so yeah. it shouldn't have mud problem this time. Yeah, they they've made some improvements this year, mm -hmm. so uh, we're we're looking forward to fun time there. I hope to see some of you, Tommy. I don't know. I've only got we got two left here of the private stock gold PL two fifty nines. I've got a few. You do? I don't know how many. I'll have to look. Here's a few. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to give these away this year or not. Since, I mean, yeah. there's only two there. We've already done that a few times. So. Yeah. But, I don't know. We, we would like to see people wearing the swag, though, showing the colors. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. If you got the colors, uh, wear them proud, man. And, uh, come by. You gotta, huh? You got you to gotta hold on to your precious metal investments these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know how many teeth we had to pull to get enough gold to make those things? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> um, anyway, if you've, if you've got the swag, wear it and uh, stop us and uh, take a picture. You should end up on the show. Yep. Very good chance. Yeah. We're always looking for some vic friends to, to put on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, anytime we're shooting a show live, we've got uh, a chat room going on at the same time. It's at amateurlogic.tv slash chat. Uh, drop in there and uh, say hello to everyone. There's a lot of folks in there having fun. Yeah. If you're on the watch, I always say it. If you're on the live stream and you're not on the chat, you're only having half the fun. True. But which half? <laughs> <laughs> Not that it really matters, but uh, hey, jump on in the chat room there if you're watching live. If you're watching the recording, there probably won't be, be many folks in there. there. Yeah. It's quite a crowd in there tonight. Yeah, it, re it really is. Well, we just told you what we've been up to here. What, what have you been up to, Peter? Well, a few family dues and a few things like that, but uh, I've just booked my tickets. Uh, seeing as you're talking about going to Dayton, which uh, I won't be attending, sadly, but I do get to go to Ham Fair in Tokyo in Japan in August, which I understand oh. is one of the biggest ham fairs around the world. So uh, I get to have my slice of ham fair fun this year. Uh, and the best thing is I get to fly there and back uh, business class. Back to you. Oh, okay. Nice. That sounds like a lot of fun. What about you, Emil? Well, down here in the bayous, uh, <laughs> I've been enjoying some time with my uh, kids who are just finishing up their uh, freshman and sophomore years in college over there in Lafayette. So uh, that's why I missed the uh, Triple D event. And I'm going to miss um, the Hamvention as well. But I have been spending some time uh, with some other amateurs doing some telly communications and we'll see a little bit about that later tell, tell the truth emil did the kids everybody leave lafayette because we showed up there yeah <laughs> they heard you were coming and they just evacuated in fact there was a big post about that and they all left <laughs> okay well we were wondering what happened yep <laughs> <laughs> well we've got a, a fun show lined up tonight let's just jump right on in it tommy i know you've got something you want to talk about tonight and uh, as a matter of fact, I know you want to talk about it, so I printed it out here for you. You did? Well, yeah. I got it on the teleprompter, too. Well, I'm going to need that back when you're finished with it, because I got all my other cheat okay. notes written on there as well. All right. Well, <clears throat> I got an email from our friend John Amadeo, um, producer from Last Man Standing. I yeah. think a lot, several people got it. But anyway, it's great news. It actually starts off. Uh, very good news. Yes, the show's coming back for 22 more episodes. Last Man Standing wow. will continue to be produced by 20th Century Fox and will air on Fox Network as opposed to ABC. The show will move back into Stage 9 at the CBS Studio Production Center in Studio City, California and will begin shooting in August and airing in September. At this time, we don't have an air date or time and we should have this information on Monday. I'm hoping to continue to produce the show and believe it will happen. Uh, not quite sure yet as I have other production commitments. Thanks for all your past support. I hope to keep some small ham radio presence on primetime network television. Regards, John Amadeo. And that's, uh, that's pretty awesome, man, because that was honestly was my favorite show. E even if it didn't have the, the ham part on there, which mm -hmm. was great. It was an awesome show. Yeah, it's uh, good to hear it's coming back. You know, we've been hearing rumors for a few weeks that mm -hmm. it it might be coming back. Well, it looks like it's going to happen. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I wish they were going to start in July because my family and I are actually going out there for vacation. Uh, first well, week of July. You could, you could work the special event there at the studio. Yeah, if they were going to have one. You know, you could even be on an episode. I can I can see it right <laughs> now. Yeah. Well, about that much of me was yeah. on one. Yeah. Well, you know, I have a special tie to that show. Yeah. Besides, you know, uh, John being a, a good friend, my radio, my HF rig was on that show. Oh, it sure was. It sure was. I no, I don't mean the model that I have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. that radio was actually on the show. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. It's famous. It is. And don't forget that our QSL cards sit in the set. They did last time. I don't yeah. know yeah, if they'll be this I time or not. I'll make it back up there. That was kind of cool. Yeah. 
Emil, do you think you can get a piece of brown paper or something and maybe no crayon? <laughs> Want to make a cheap QSL? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I love that show, though. I still watch the outtakes and the bloopers to this day on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the show was fantastic. Yeah, glad to see that it's going to be coming back. Well, Peter, what are you going to show us this this month? I know you've been working on something here. I didn't really know... Or, or haven't seen what uh, what you're going to talk about here anyway. Well, it's a it's a bit of a mixed bag. I actually started off um, uh, uh, when I make segments. Uh, what I like to do is to show whatever I'm working on or whatever I'm interested in at any point in time. Um, and I started off uh, doing a bit of research into micro Python for micro or rather Python for microcontrollers and uh, micro Python and uh, some of the alternatives, both uh, software and hardware. And uh, I got halfway through that, and uh, this arrived. Well, this is my new toy. So you've got to get a bit of a, a mixed bag, as you, you'll see here, a little bit on MicroPython and a little bit on this and, what, and why I've actually gotten this particular phone. Uh, so, yep, roll tape and you'll see. Hello and welcome once again. This month I've been doing a bit of research on the subject of Python on microcontrollers. Now previously I'd heard about something called MicroPython, but I hadn't used it or looked into it, and so I thought, well, let's go have a look at it. And what, what other options are there for using Python on microcontrollers? Uh, we're just going to briefly cover what's available today, and then I've got a surprise afterwards. If you want to learn Python, check out the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's online unit, Introduction to Computer Science and Programming, which I highly recommend and have completed. It's also free of any cost. Python is a very handy language to know because the Raspberry Pi microprocessor board operating system Raspbian comes with Python installed. The language was created by Guido Van Rossum in 1991 and now has an extensive number of add-on libraries to add extra functionality. It's like basic on steroids, minus the line numbers. Let's now look at a couple of the more popular and well-supported Python implementations for microcontrollers. Let's start with MicroPython. I was surprised to find that MicroPython was written by an Australian physicist and computer programmer by the name of Damien George. Damien speaks Dutch and is a fellow friend of a TV producer here in Melbourne. It's a small world. But it's not just software that Damien has created. As a consequence of a successful Kickstarter campaign, he also markets a small microcontroller development board based on an STM32F405RG microcontroller. It features a 168 MHz Cortex-M4 CPU with hardware floating point, 1024 KB flash ROM, and 192 KB RAM, a micro USB connector for power and serial communication, a micro SD card slot supporting standard and high capacity SD cards, a 3-axis accelerometer, real-time clock, 29 GPIO pins, plus LED and switch GPIO available, also along with a number of other features. Those are very respectable specifications for a microcontroller and means that the board potentially could do some advanced timing functions like frequency measurement in the megahertz range. I was curious to find out what the motivation Damien had in writing MicroPython and who his target audience was. However, at the time of making this segment, he had not gotten back to me yet. However, his Kickstarter page gives some clues as to the philosophy behind the language. To quote Damien, Compared with an Arduino, the MicroPython board is more powerful, easier to program, and you don't need a compiler on your PC. Compared with a Raspberry Pi, the MicroPython board is cheaper, smaller, simpler, you can make one yourself, or even modify the design to fit your needs, and it uses less power. Most other boards are programmed in C, which is a low-level language and can be difficult to program correctly. On the other hand, Python is a very high-level language, which means that Python has simpler, smaller code to do the same thing as C. 
MicroPython can also be run on other hardware such as the Arduino, ESP8266, ESP32, and there's a version of MicroPython for the BBC MicroBit. One nice feature of Damien's website is that he has a virtual machine on which you can run MicroPython code you've written. Here's a simple example of the ubiquitous Hello World program. And there is a large community now supporting MicroPython. Another hardware choice is an Adafruit development board called Circuit Playground Express with an interpreted Python language called Circuit Playground, which is based on MicroPython. It features a 48 MHz ARM Cortex processor, 2 MB of flash memory, a micro USB port and various sensors. So there's a lower speed processor than Damien's hardware, but much more flash memory. Another Python for microcontroller competitor is Xerinth. It claims to allow designing embedded applications and Internet of Things connected devices using any 32-bit microcontroller, and that's a big claim. Xerinth allows mixing Python and C code. The Xerinth developers claim that Xerinth is so space efficient, it's a micro micro Python. So those, on the basis of my research, are the three most developed and supported options for programming Python on a microcontroller. I found several others, but they were either discontinued, still in development, or lacked a substantial community or commercial support. So there you go, a number of options for implementing Python on a microcontroller. Do go check them out. Now, I promised you a surprise. And indeed, sharp-eyed viewers will have noticed that my picture looks just a little bit different than usual. Maybe the sound is also a little bit different as well. Uh, maybe you want to comment on that. Well, what's happened is that this month uh, I've just received a new phone. It's a Xiaomi Redmi Note 5, Chinese version, and I'm filming this segment uh, on it at the moment. And I think it's giving a pretty good picture. The reason I got the phone was later this year I'm visiting Tokyo in Japan to visit Ham Fair, a huge ham fest uh, that, that's there. And I thought, well, I could bring my video camera, but it's big and bulky and conspicuous. So I thought instead, well, why not take a mobile phone and, you know, video as I go along. The only trouble is with a mobile phone, or at least the ones I've owned to date, is that as you walk along, your picture is really, really jerky and whatnot. But this phone's got a number of features that are really, really good in terms of video quality. And it's also got a 12 and 5 megapixel camera on the back. So anyway, I just thought I'd show you uh, the features in operation because it's really quite impressive. The first feature I like about this camera is its ability to refocus very quickly. So at the moment it's focused on things that are very far away. And now there's my hand which is close. And as you see it changes focus very quickly. The other feature I really like about this camera is its image stabilization. Now at the moment I've got the image stabilization turned off. And so let's walk along and see how much the camera jerks up and down. I've now switched the optical image stabilization on, so let's try it out. There, that's a lot smoother. Now in the situation of a trade show or a ham show that I might be filming at, this is going to give a much better video result for people watching. Well, I think that's a very, very good result, but I'm interested to hear your feedback about whether you think the video and audio quality is acceptable or not. So, by all means, on Facebook or YouTube, do leave a comment about whether you think this uh, mobile phone can actually double as a video recorder effectively or not. Thanks. Yeah, it looks well, pretty fine. good, yeah. especially the outside video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it looked really good, and the, the, you're right, the stabilization on it looked really nice. did, did a good yeah. job. Well, well, that, that's what sold me uh, for it. Um, some of these uh, the uh, of the Redmi phones have only got the one camera, 
uh, on the back. So uh, you don't get that, that quick focusing. But this has got two cameras on the back, a 12 and 5 megapixel camera. It's got a 13 megapixel camera on the front as well. Um, so uh, from a video perspective, it's very, very good. Um, I had, had as you, I did a segment a few years ago where I talked about the possibility of using a phone for segments and it could be done. But I, as I said, I found that when you actually needed to move around with the phone, um, you really needed that optical image stabilization. And uh, now this phone has actually got that, that feature, which uh, is what sold me uh, on it. Nice looking phone, Peter. The micro Python stuff was kind of interesting. Email, are you, are you a Python coder? You know, I'm, I'm going to say that Peter's going to have me hooked on something else now. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've written, I've written some scripts, and I've uh, started on Python on that Raspberry Pi. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's addictive. Yeah, it's interesting yeah, I, language. I, I, uh, I'm sorry, Peter. Go yeah. ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I'm just going to quickly say I I hate curly brackets with a vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you get used to them, you know. I, I never liked them. You know, I was a, a, a basic programmer and uh, Visual Basic several yeah. versions, but then I moved to C Sharp, man, and I kind of like it now. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you, after you've done a, written a few thousand of them, this makes it really easy to see where your box of code began yeah. and end. Python, I haven't, I haven't delved into that at all. Yeah, yeah. I did a little bit with it. I need to do some more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's good fun. Yeah. And, and the best thing is it's very readable. That's the key thing. So is C code once you know it. <laughs> yeah. If you don't, though, yeah, I can see it. And, and some of that C++ gets a little uh, head scratching. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got an email here from uh, our friend Mark, KE7WA, and... Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, you know, guys, I know a lot of people out there say, well, I don't have room to, to set up HF antennas at my shack, or, you know, I got a neighborhood covenant, so I just, I can't really have a station there. Well, Mark, Mark worked around all these obstacles here. He's got something I think is pretty nice. Here's his ham shack. It's a craftsman uh, <laughs> toolbox or a toolbox combination workbench there. Huh. He says that um, he added an IC3700. I'm not familiar with that model number, uh, but I think he means 7300. Yeah. Okay. And a super antenna, uh, HF Super Whip. And that, that's the... Um, well, that's cool. That That is cool. He's got everything you need right there. He's got his dual band rig. He's got his HF rig. Handy got the talkie. band chart there on his. I guess that's on his iPad. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Power supply, everything on a roll around cart there. So easy to to set up. Just roll it out and plug it in. Uh, he says when he's not using it, he's got a barbecue grill cover that he uses to protect it against <clears throat> rain. And I believe here is here's his antenna right here. He's just got it on a tripod out there and just rolls it out when he wants to use it. Oh, uh, a la Wayne. Yep, exactly. So but that's I mean, cool. That's not nice, that's nice and portable. There's really no excuse not to get on the air at all. No, you can you can do it if you want to. if you want to. Man, Grant, that's probably not going to work as good as some kind of yagi up on a hundred foot tower, but. No, but it sure beats, it beats not having one at all. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so... Yeah, I bet she's made a lot of contacts on that. I bet he has. Looks like a lot of fun. Well, thanks for sharing that, Mark. You know, it's always good to see how people are, are getting creative in the hobby and yeah. and what they do at their shop. Yeah, I love seeing stuff like that. Yeah, appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. Well, we're going to be back in just a minute because I know Email has got something here. He is... Uh, Looking forward to telecommunicating to us. But cheap first, sty cheap style, right? Cheap style, yeah. <laughs> Spring is in the air. Check out ICOM's line of D Star radios. ICOM offers a variety of high performance and innovative products, 
And you can stay connected around the world with ICOM's D-Star radios. ICOM's newest D-Star handheld is ready for the season ahead. Lightweight, compact, and tough, the new ID31A Plus is a great choice for any shack or those in harsh environments. 70 centimeters, analog and digital, terminal mode, access point mode, and its IPX waterproof rating. The ICOM ID51A Plus 2 provides extended D-Star coverage, allowing you to listen to whatever you want. Terminal and access mode, send and receive text messages and pictures, DV fast data mode, and easy FM repeater setting. The compact and user-friendly ID4100A is a D-Star mobile with big rig features, its intuitive interface, variety of operating modes, and Bluetooth capability make this a preferred D-Star option for those on the go. Integrated GPS receiver, new dot matrix display for enhanced DR mode and GPS information, terminal mode and access point mode, applications for iOS and Android devices, and there's a micro SD card slot for voice and data storage. ICOM's ID5100A has taken innovation and mobility to the next level. With its touchscreen and internal GPS, this radio is a must-have while assessing a situation. 5.5-inch display responds naturally to the touch. DVDV Dual Watch receives both FM-FM and FM-DV modes simultaneously. VS-3 Bluetooth headset provides hands-free communications. And you can show your position, course, and speed with the integrated GPS receiver. Learn more about D-Star today. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur. And thanks, Icom, for being a sponsor of Amateur Logic here. Really Definitely appreciate that. Yep. Email. What's what's yeah. on the, oh, what's hanging there? Not hanging up, but what's what you got hanging there? Well, I was uh, I happened to chance upon a, a Facebook group um, while browsing through some of the emergency the Aries groups we had here, and I noticed there was quite a few people on a service called the Ham Shack Hotline um, online, and I said okay. Uh, this looks expensive, so I kind of shied away from it at first. But then I figured out that it's a free service. It's dedicated to hams, and there's a bunch of people already on it, and I could get started for $35. So oh. it was right up my alley. That's pretty cheap. Met all the bullet points, huh? <laughs> all the bullet points were hit, so check it out. <laughs> oh, George, Peter, and Tommy wanted to tell you guys about a service I found online for hams who wanted to uh, do some communicating outside of uh, the radio when maybe the situation is not as emergent. The name of the service is Ham Shack Hotline as you can see there by their uh, Facebook page. They also have their own website in which you can uh, read about how to register and how to uh, figure out which devices are capable of using the system and a bunch of other other information as well. The directory, uh, they have their own online help desk and uh, support system. They only ask a few things that you uh, be patient with them and uh, help out even if you can. So it's kind of a ham community spirited system that works very well. I was able to pick up one of the supported uh, systems that they use here, or phone uh, sets that they use. It is a SIP service that works over the internet which means it needs to be configured to use their service. Being the cheap old man that I am, I was able to get one of these phones for about $35 and, and configure it relatively easy using their uh, documentation that was online. There's quite a few, uh, few people in my area that are using this service, so it does benefit me to uh, use the system and uh, communicate with uh, other people in my area. Uh, one of the neat things I found too that the, the phone itself actually has its own uh, web uh, service like most devices do today so that you can uh, see what's going on and, and pick up any information that might have been missed or missed calls. Uh, there's some other things you can do with that, speed dial buttons. A pretty neat service uh, from these guys. It, uh, it works. It just works. They do maintain a map of extensions and some of the people using the system here. Uh, they, 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 uh, so you can have a visual of who might be around your area, which I think is pretty darn neat. 
And like I mentioned earlier, they also have a ticketing system in which uh, you can troubleshoot problems that you may be having during provisioning or after provisioning and, and service uh, related issues. It's volunteer funded. In fact, the whole service is volunteer uh, type service. So, uh, you know, give them a break on uh, some timeliness and, and be patient with them. They're, they're doing a good thing for us. So they also maintain their phone book online as well. So that's how it was pretty neat. Uh, there's some conference bridges and there I am. Um, find me on there in the system. I am, I'm at 4156 as far as extensions go. But uh, there are some, quite a few, like I said, people on here. It, uh, I think they're having somewhat of a growth spurt at the moment. There are also conference um, bridges, conference lines, uh, other you know features that you can use. So there's an online directory of those things here. Uh, available for your easy reference. Uh, like I said, they put a lot of thought into this and and uh, just made it work. And so far, so good. It's very good service uh, from my perspective. There is a file section that they uh, encourage you to read. I was able to read that, find what I needed to find in short time because of the thought and effort they put into this file repository available on Facebook. Um, that shows you what devices you can use and how to set them up once you receive the devices. And they also tell you some of the uh, things to watch out for on the, uh, you know, some gotchas that you really got to uh, pay attention to, you know, to, to avoid uh, some issues that they've known and, you know, from their knowledge and experiences with their system. So good information here, well put together, and my favorite part, it just works. While I was reading some of their online comments and posts, uh, I ran across one of our viewers, uh, Mr. Biederman, in Illinois, and uh, I just couldn't help but to ask uh, what this extension was, so I gave him a call, and sure enough, we had a, uh, a good chat over the phone and flawless uh, communications between us. So here's a little excerpt of that. So I just so happened to be browsing through the directory one day on this service, this new service, the Ham Shack Hotline, and uh, ran across one of our uh, viewers. Let's see if he's there. Yeah, uh, well, I think I got this one, this 303 model, from a reseller in Florida who, who had a bunch of used, you know, uh, liquidation type things. It was like mm -hmm. thirty dollars out of Florida somewhere. Wow. Yeah, that's what I paid for this phone, and then I didn't have anything that has power over Ethernet, and uh, I was like, oh, I'll just buy, it. you know, get the power supply. So that was like seven dollars or something like that. I got mine on uh, Amazon. I asked the question, "Hey, are these unlocked?" and the password, and like. A few people replied, oh, mine are, and then, you know, one guy was like $40, one guy was like $30, and he had really good feedback, and I was like, you know. So how did you, I, I got a question for you, how did you come to watch or, or figure out Amateur Logic? Um, how did I find, I had a, I have a Roku box, and I found Amateur Logic through Roku. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then, I I don't know, a friend of mine told me about Ham Nation, so I ended up watching between both of those shows, so I've seen all that. I've pretty much seen all the amateur logics, I've, you know, sat down and watched them, and, yep. you, know, you know, Jim burnt, almost burning his house down at him, <laughs> and put the torch, and, you know, uh, Tommy and George are great people. You know, I will. I bet we'll end up seeing some way of interfacing a radio to this telephone. Man. No, no doubt. Right. No Maybe doubt. Dial into it and link into a radio. That'll be next. SIP, VoIP. You know, it's all the same thing. IP. Right. <laughs> well, cool, Don. I'm gonna go in and uh, see what's going on. I think my food may have arrived. All right. It was great to talk to you, Mel. Same here, Don. See, All right, seven three. We'll be looking forward for the next uh, cheap old man moment. <laughs> All right, we'll do. All right, bye. Later. So there you have it, folks. The Ham Shack Hotline connecting hams across the country. 
and even our own viewers are already there. 73K5QKR. Only hams can get on that, right? Yeah, it is. Um, they ask for your call sign, and they ask that you follow their rules and, and go through their procedure to get on for provisioning and other things and just be patient with them because they are kind of experiencing somewhat of a growth spurt right now. So, And you probably just helped that some, too. I think I might have. <laughs> yeah, Don, Don uh, he's been watching the show for a long time. Yeah. You know, we when we... Uh, even back when we started the Echo Link uh, nets a long time ago, he was one of the first ones checking in on there. Yeah. Yeah, he's been been on a good bit. So you just plug it into your router? Yeah, it's a, it's on a switch that's out here. You know, I have a point to point link from the house right. to the um uh internet provider in the in my main house and that's uh what um it, it works great over that. I mean it's not having any issues that I can find at all yet. Do you open uh, or do any port forwarding or anything to make it work? I did not have to open any ports. It's a SIP service. There is uh, specific ports, but whatever setup that I'm, you know, working on here just went right through. Oh, hmm. You got power over Ethernet at your house? You know, hey guys, someone's calling on the line right now. You want to take a call? Huh? Go ahead. Who's calling, That's, Emil? Uh, it's Glenn KG5CN in the chat room. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's see what Glenn's doing tonight. Let's see. Hello, Glenn. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. All right. Hey, how you doing? Doing pretty good. And I wanted to let you know I did you one better. Uh-oh. Uh, I used a, uh, the, uh, the ATA, the analog telephone adapter, which only cost me 30 bucks from Amazon. Uh-oh. You beat me by $5, in other words. <laughs> And I had a, uh, a set of uh, cordless phones here that I plugged into it. So I got one in the shack and one in the bedroom. So in case somebody has to alert me in the middle of the night about something to come up on the air. But uh, right now they've got uh, 229 people on the system. 39 of them are in Louisiana. Mississippi's got none right now. Okay. Uh, we may have to uh, one fix in Alabama, that. Alabama, five in Florida, uh, twenty-four in uh, New York, and uh, excuse me, twenty in New York and uh, twenty-seven in Massachusetts. Well, they're well, usually hit. They're hitting all the the hurricane-prone areas right now, and they're calling this the "before all else fails." <laughs> well, Tommy <laughs> George said they're going to fix that Mississippi uh, uh, blank there. On their end, and uh, well, shoot, I appreciate your uh, calling us up, Glenn. And you beat me by five bucks. I think we might have a new winner. Uh, <laughs> and and it's good to know that you can have uh, analog phones as well. Um, so that's what you're using. You're, you're actually using the old analog phones you had through an adapter that converts it to SIP. Correct. Okay. Hmm. So they what? got some, they got some features. I know there's voicemail and there's conference groups and. Again, the reason I joined it was because uh, a lot of our uh, EOCs and ARIES groups kind of coordinate their efforts well, while everything's not failed. All right. Well, pre appreciate the call, Glenn. Now we're going to have to find out what, the, what adapter Glenn got. Yeah. All right. There's a list on their site of supported devices, and they even have uh, a test environment where they're trying all sorts of brands and other devices to see and how it can bring people in, like soft phones. And uh, there was a conference bridge stood up one time where someone had his phone tethered to his car's Wi-Fi, and he was in the conference while he was going to work or driving. Uh, people are doing some things here. Wow. That's hmm. pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, we may have to change the... the um, we need to put at least two dots on the map for Mississippi. Yeah. At least. Yeah. I think we do. Oh, cool. I have never seen that shirt for sale in the wild there. It's not, is it? No, it's not. But Somebody actually sent me this shirt, and me I too. really wish I could remember. It's horrible. I wish I could remember who it was, because I, I like the shirt, yeah. and uh, I'd like to get the design back from him. So if you sent it, and you still yeah. have the design, if you'll send it, I'll see about getting them put over in the spread shirt shop. You said spread shirt? Oh, look at that. <laughs> 
That's almost like it was on cue, isn't it? It is kind of, isn't it? If you want to get a shirt, but not like this one, you can go to amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com. We've got Amateur Logic swag there and some Am College swag yeah. as well. Um, and this is a great time to go because Hamvention's coming up at the end of this coming week. Boy, what good timing. It is it is perfect. You may have to have, expedite your order to get it in yeah. time, though. Yep. I'm assuming they'll get it in time. I, well, yeah, you might ought to check on there. I don't but remember. If they don't, then just write Amateur Logic on a piece of duct tape and put it on your that, T-shirt. That works, too. <laughs> and it's uh, cheap old man approved. <laughs> 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 I had hunt around and uh, I found um, a, an email from Elliot K1 uh, Mike Foxtrot. Uh, he enjoyed my piece on the FRG7, um, and he mentions that back in the 70s he worked for a, a place called Arrow Electronics in Norwich in CT. Yeah. I think that's Connecticut. I've heard of that. And uh, uh, he says, and we sold ham radio gear. On Friday nights, when we were up late, open late, we would often listen to shortwave radio on that radio. When it came uh, time to make a purchase of a radio back then, it was a toss-up between the Yaesu FRG7 or the Kenwood TS700, all mode two-metre rig. The Kenwood won out. However, I do have a soft spot for the FRG7. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Elliot. Uh, some great memories there of, um, you know, uh, uh, playing with radios back in the 70s when shortwave was really at, at its peak. Yeah. That was apparently a pretty popular radio. Apparently so. I, you know, I'm, I honestly never heard of it. Before. I haven't either. Okay, we've got more to go. As a matter of fact, we've got a little game show that's going to be, uh, be happening here in just a few minutes. I can hardly wait to see what it is. I know, because yeah. I really hadn't told you exactly. <laughs> Or, or either one of y'all, either, and the audience yeah. you know, in the chat room can play around on this one as well. You know, we'll be, we'll be taking all answers on these questions. They, I think they're all going to be pretty easy, but we'll just have to see. SDR transceivers are great with colorful waterfall displays that accurately present everything there is to see across the band at a single glance. If you want to know where the activity is, who's generating splatter, what's happening in the DX window, how wide your audio is, or what frequencies are clear for calling CQ, it's all right there. Unfortunately, it's information you won't get from many conventional radios without wasting a lot of time tuning around. However, you don't need to get rid of that perfectly good rig to go SDR, thanks to miniature wideband SDR receivers like SDR Play's RSP family, now available at a station accessory price. All it takes is a convenient way to pair one up with your transceiver. That's where the MFJ1708 SDR comes in. Here's how it works. The MFJ1708 SDR provides a matched end signal splitter, so your transceiver and SDR unit share the same high-performance antenna system. This arrangement allows you to simultaneously watch and listen. Then, when you key up to transmit, the MFJ1708 SDR cuts off and grounds the SDR antenna line, providing your SDR with bulletproof protection from damaging RF. It's the perfect plug-and-play solution for upgrading your shack to widescreen living color. The MFJ1708 SDR uses the PTT signal from your rig to initiate the switching, but as a fail-safe measure, built-in RF sensing circuitry will provide a measure of safety if the PTT connection is lost. Why not let the MFJ1708 SDR complete your shack? MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at MFJEnterprises.com. It's time to play a little game right now that... Uh I like to call Sounds of the Studio. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's how we're going to play it. I've got some sound clips here. Some of these are things you would hear on uh, amateur radio. Some of them are sounds you might hear on a computer or in nature or anywhere. They're just just some, most of them are audio anomalies, but it's just some different um, irritating sounds and effects. Irritating. Great. Yeah, that 
that you could run across <laughs> in daily life. Now, here's the reason I brought it up. It's because a lot of times I'll hear somebody trying to describe to somebody else on the air what they sound like. Sometimes they say, your underwear seems kind of pinched up. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not one there, of the sounds. That's not one of the sounds. Good. <laughs> you know, I, I never found the exact definition for that one. I I think it could mean a couple of different things. We're not going there. <laughs> Did anybody eat red beans and rice tonight? <laughs> <laughs> so, here here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to play one of these sounds, and then I'm going to come back and let everyone... Uh, uh, gather a consensus and tell us what word describes this sound that we just had. And you should know most of them, but some people will use some different terms for a few of these. So we're not going to tell what the sound is. We're going to tell what it sounds like. You can tell what it, it is if you want okay. to. Okay. Yeah. But I've just got one word descriptors here that I'm going to use. And uh, we'll see if, if what y'all think it's called. It's the same thing that I think it's called. So that you won't go on the air telling somebody, uh, well... Sounds like your underwear is pinched up. Exactly. Yeah. You know, because you don't want to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be the guy that says it or the guy that's experiencing so, it. I don't even want to be, you know, innocent third party to that. You no. Know? But, but it happens. <laughs> okay, first sound here tonight. Let's see if everyone can identify this one. Let's let the sound play, and then we'll, we'll come back and see what everybody thinks. And we want, before we just state out exactly what it is, we want to, you know, wait a few seconds to give the people here in the chat room uh, a little bit of time to, to respond as well. So here's our first sound. There's some good guesses coming in the chat room there. Apparently the buffer's it not sound, as big as I thought it was. It sounds like you got that first pot all the way up and the air conditioner's running. It does. It does kind of sound like that. Let's yeah. see. I would just I would describe that as a hiss. I would uh, call it white noise. Okay. We've got a pink noise and a white noise. We've got rain. We got radar. Yeah, I was going with the rain on my, the cheap old man metal roof here in the shack. Yeah, bacon, running water, tire puncture, could be whoopsie. <laughs> uh, the, the word that I was looking for there is hiss. And yes. yep. Australians do it again. <laughs> yeah, so Peter... Peter got that one there. You know, this used to be a real common sound when we used analog tape. They got all those snakes down in Australia. They do, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one had a pretty long hiss to them. It though. did. Yeah. But they're pretty deadly. So, uh, hiss. That's what we were looking for there. So, if somebody says, I'm hearing some hiss in your audio, that's the sound they're talking about. Way to go, Peter. Or they might say they hear some white noise or, or pink noise or any number of other things. But hiss is what I was looking for as an audio engineer. So, uh, And I noticed, uh, I didn't see what Marty said in there. You know, I would, well, Marty said pink noise. Well, it could, it could be. You could, you could legitimately get by with that. But I'm looking for the simplest layman's phrase here on these. Okay, now... Wow, that was a really annoying sound. That was an annoying sound. Now, that might be what you hear if you've got a broke cable on your microphone or some... or maybe a light dimmer. Yeah. You know, uh, we want to see what folks call this. And I would call it, uh, given that you're American, I'll say it's a 60 hertz hum. I, w I would call it a hum. You would call it a hum. Most people are calling it a hum over in the chat room. But there are a couple of people I see in there that got the answer I was looking for. David says an annoying hum. 
tinnitus. He nailed know. it. <laughs> Doesn't sound like tinnitus. Uh, Jocelyn got it. Uh, Peter, what do, what do you call it? Hum. Well, I call it, it, if it was in Australia, I would call it a 50 hertz hum. If it's in America, I'd call it a 60 hertz hum. All right, what would you call it, Emil? I'd call it a ground loop hum. What would you call it? I'd call it a hum. All right. I'd call it a buzz. Really? Yeah, I I would call that a buzz. If you listen to how raspy... You listen to Ham College these days, you'll hear a buzz. Here. Let's, <laughs> or let's, get a buzz. Let's hear that again. Ooh. Yeah, I call that a buzz. You, buzz. you hear it's kind of raspy sounding. However, there there are some other sounds out there I would... Uh, <clears throat> That that sound kind of familiar with it. Here, let's let's just play the next one here. Now here's one. But if the other one was a buzz, that's got to be a hum. You think it's a hum? Hmm. 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 Okay. Uh, no, Soren, it's not 50 hertz. It was actually 60 hertz. What are we going to call that one? What What are you going to call that one, Peter? Oh, that I would call a hum as well, but a low hum. 60 hertz hum. That's what, that's what I would call it. Well, what would you have called it, Emil? I would have called it a bad connection on my uh, guitar amp. No, that would be a buzz. Actually, yeah, oh. actually, that's what I thought about when I heard that other one. Yeah. Like when you plug the, uh, the connector in, you hear that first boom. Yep. So what would you call this one? I'd call it a hum. A hum. All right, that's what I was looking for. The first one was real raspy sounding. If you actually um, tried to analyze that first one, I actually, I tried to put some 60 hertz notch filters on that first one because that's what you would use to notch out a hum. It didn't work on that oh, buzz. Right. There's so many other harmonics mixed in with that 60 hertz there that... Uh, you know, just notching out 60 won't take it out. Oh. Uh, so that first one's a buzz. Second one's a hum. It's pretty much was, was only 60 cycles on that one. I'm hoping that some of you will get this one right here. This is a sound quite common in sound recordings. It might be confused with another effect, but what is the name of this particular effect we're listening to right now? Okay. Uh, before you guys speak, let's give the chat room a, a chance to catch up. Yeah, I'm thinking everybody's pretty... <laughs> David said it's his. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think most people are going to get that one right, right yeah. there. And, and there's two different answers that we're seeing there. Well, actually, three now. And I think all of those are, are correct. What do you say it is, Peter? Overmodulation. All right. Email? Distortion. Tommy? I'm, I'm with the meal. Distortion. And that's what I would say. Distortion or clipping. We, we're seeing some clipping over in the chat room here, and that's correct. That's what clipping would sound like. Uh, that's what overmodulation would sound like as well. So um, good good turnout on that one, everybody but David. No, David, it's not his. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> um, all right, another one here. Now, this is going to be two different ones here, and I could see people getting these wrong, but there's there's a subtle distinction between them that you would call call it either one or the other. But let's hear the first one. This is a sound quite common in sound recordings. It might be confused with another effect, but what is the name of this particular effect we're listening to right now? Okay, let's see, uh, give the chat room a moment there to come back, and I think, no, yeah. it's not CB talk, although you probably might, <laughs> might hear that on people, CB. People pay good money to have that put in there. We're, we're seeing some pretty good answers there. Some of them are, are what I'm looking for. Some of them are the ones I thought would, would be confused with that effect. What do you, what do I was, you say I would call it reverb. With? You'd call it reverb. Yeah. First, I wanted to say echo, but I sounded like I could hear multiple, not just one. Mm -hmm. 
come uh, out. Well, email. What do you say it is? Yeah, being an electric guitar player, every amp I've ever owned had the spring reverb. Yeah. Um, reverb's the answer I was looking for there. Uh, a lot of people were saying reverb, a lot were saying echo. Um, reverb, and the, the key to that one is, well, it's, it's all, um, reverb and echo both are a sound repeating or delays and you're getting this, the same sound again. As email says, spring reverb and a guitar amplifier would sound like that. Um, but the trick to reverb is the delay is pretty short. There is not a very long delay between the original signal and the decayed signal. And there's usually, um, you can't count a single repeat of of what you heard it's kind of like a lot of them that's what i was trying to say yeah. i could hear i could hear multiples going so by. let's just listen to that real quick again and for a comparison here this is a sound quite common in sound recordings it might be confused with another effect but all right so you hear there it's it's mostly it just sounds sort of like a big room but you can't really distinguish uh, a single repeat in there now here's another one. Uh, well, let's let's listen. It is very similar. This, this is, is a sound, sound quite, quite common, common in sound, sound recordings. recordings. It, it might, might be confused, confused with, with another, another effect. effect. But, but what, what is, is the, the name, name of this particular effect we're, we're listening, listening to right, right now? now? Okay, I think uh, I'm I think pretty most sure we're going to get. I'll get that one. Yeah. What uh, email? <clears throat> What's that sound? Um, delay for me. Get that that would work, yeah. Uh, Tommy, echo, echo. Peter, echo, and echo is what I was looking for, but delay, yep, it's a delay as well. Um, so the difference between reverb and echo, reverb you can't really distinguish a, a single repeat. It just sounds like you're in a big room. Echo, it's definitely a repeat of. You know the original signal there, uh, but we've got echo and uh, delay both coming in the chat room. There, we'll take either either answer on that one right there. Now this next one, I don't know how many people are going to get this one right. There's a word that I used to describe that if I was trying to tell somebody in layman's terms what they sounded like. There's several words you could you could describe this as, but I'm looking for one in particular. Let's uh, let's listen to this. Here's another sound you'll likely encounter on some stations on the HF band that are running external microphones. What would you call this sound right here? Okay, Tommy, what what would you call that sound? I I hope you heard it that time. Yeah, just didn't have any highs. It's kind of a kind of a muffled sound. You'd call it muffled. Yeah. All right. Uh, Peter, what would you call that one? I call it muffled. Email? I'm going to go with that. Muffled. Muffled will work. I, I would probably call it muddy. But muffled and muddy, it's the same thing. Well, she, from Mississippi, everything's muddy down here. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't anybody <laughs> say muddy in there? Probably not. Somebody said it sounds like an EV mic with too much proximity effect. Yeah, it does sound like an RE20, doesn't it, Marty? Uh, muggled. Yeah, that could work. Overdriven. <laughs> no, I wouldn't call it overdriven. Hollow. Probably wouldn't call it hollow. It was just muffled. What it actually was is I boosted the bass way up on that, like some folks will do when they put a, a new mic on their HF rig and a mixer. They'll crank up the bass. Oh, yeah. But you lose all your power is going to to modulation that people can't really distinguish very well. So you lose a lot of intelligibility and power in your signal if you do that. Some is good. Too much is just uh, Too hard much. to understand. It's muddy. Yeah. It's muddy. It's muddy. <laughs> or muffled. Okay. Basie, Basie works as well. Could be, could be either one. So I think uh, most of all, all our answers there, if you were to tell somebody over the air that it sounded like this, you know, I, I think they'd know what you're talking about. 
Uh, this next one here, I've seen this answer come up a couple of times, and uh, we're actually going to expose what this sound is right now. This is another sound you might be familiar with. Possibly you heard it at a concert or uh, somewhere a PA system was in use. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, and I'm not going to ask Emil first because I think Emil <laughs> will have a pretty good idea on that. What would you call that, Peter? Um, well, I, I, I noticed two things. Uh, there was a little bit of feedback, but there was also the audio sounded very hollow. All right, what would you uh, well, say? I think feedback must be what you're looking for, but he's right. It was kind of a tinny sound. Well, but I think feedback is probably the, the answer. All right, email? Feedback. Feedback. Everybody's getting that over in the chat room. Feedback. And the reason it sounded hollow is, um, well, I used a different microphone. I actually used this microphone right here because it's omnidirectional, and I stood in front of a speaker over there, and I just cranked it up to some of the sound out of the speaker was feeding back into the microphone. Usually when that happens, you'll get a hollow sound mm -hmm. kind of as part of the effect there because you're boosting certain frequencies, and it just rings. Somebody did say ringing in there as well. Sorin did. So, uh, yeah. And then we got ringing feedback. So all of those were right right there. Um, how, do you, how do you prevent that? Well, you get the microphone away from the speaker. You know, if you're setting up a, a PA system, say this is our speaker right here. You don't want to sit that speaker right beside the microphone. You really don't want that speaker behind you if the microphone's right here. You want that speaker on the other side of the microphone so that the sound is going away from it. It's not, not feeding back. You also don't want your headphones turned up too loud uh, to the point to where they're doing that. I actually had a conversation with a guy one night. He had really good sounding audio, but I heard this continuous whistle in it. Yeah. And I thought, man, that sounds like feedback. But I, I guess he wasn't hearing it, but he had his headphones up, and I think he had one ear pulled back or something, uh, and it was, it was feeding back. You probably back. don't want to use omnidirectional mic either if you can help it. Well, if you can help if it. You... Some, some places you need it, but... Yeah, if you're going to do um, sound reinforcement or anywhere, you know, you got a speaker open in there, uh, it's something to watch out for. Okay, here's well, this this one's interesting. Let's let's listen to this one. Usually, the cleanest signal you can get is just with straight audio and adding no kind of effects or external processing to it. However, there's an effect that you can use which can increase the loudness of a signal. Just like everything else, though, if you overuse it, it can get obnoxious pretty quick. Okay, I, I hope maybe we'll get some correct answers on that, and we'll do a little discussion on that and why you need to avoid it. Uh, let's go... Peter looks puzzled. Let's go to him first. Um, two things. Loose connection. And secondly, uh, also um, uh, over-processed or speech processing. Okay. All right. I see Emil shaking his head. What would you say, Emil? Yeah, I, I would have to throw the flag on over-compression. Okay, the the first part or the second part? Compression. <laughs> the second part was uh, with the compressor on and uh, set way too high. Right. Tommy? Yeah, kind of overdriven, sort of. Okay, you, yeah, that, that could be a term to describe it. Almost everyone in the chat room is saying compression. That's actually what it was. I, I did... Uh, a lot of compression on that one. I did a little limiting on it too, and compression and limiting kind of oh, so that's very why similar I've had that things. fact at the end there, then. Yeah, uh, it was it was way over compressed, or you could say processed um, on the end there. You will hear some people that turn the compression 
or um, the processing on their radio and crank her on up thinking it's making it louder and it is but you know they're sitting right there next to their amplifier and the fan screaming out and everybody uh, hears the thing gasping for breath between every syllable <laughs> that they speak and you can overdo it real easily and it's it's very uncomfortable to listen to for very long so a little processing little compression can help uh, too much actually hurts your signal you can actually run so much compression and limiting that you make your loudness go down oh yeah yeah so well it uh, hurt your ears too yeah so everybody yeah everybody pretty much nailed that one over in the chat room there uh way too much gain on a static microphone yeah it would it would sound like that the pumping and breathing yeah you could hear that in there plainly marty on the um, on the second part of that now here's another one that uh, I don't know how many folks will get this right, but let's let's just see. Sometimes if you're in a noisy location or you're located some distance from the microphone, you might hear a good bit of background noise. There is a particular type of device that can be used to help with this. However, if you overuse it, it can sound like a broken wire. Okay, I don't know how well you can hear that. Um, there was some hiss that I injected in the background of that right there. Mm -hmm. And email is smiling too much. I can't go to him first. Um, Peter looks puzzled once again. Tommy, I don't know. He's cheating. He's so, looking in the chat room. No, I saw my name. Oh. Uh, it sounded like it had too much noise reduction. Mm. Yeah, but what what type, what what was I used? I was trying to get rid of some noise. What did I use to get rid of it? It's just a single word. What kind of effect did I pull? filter? All right. Well, we'll say filter. Uh, Peter, what would you say that was? Uh. Yeah, it's got me puzzled at the moment. I know what it is from an electrical point of view, but I just can't think what the uh, the, the term would be. Um, Email. You were smiling mighty big there. I would call it a noise gate myself because I've, uh, again, used some things on the uh, guitar and things so you don't get the sounds in between when you're playing some uh, purdy melodies. Yep. Uh, that that's what I was looking for. There is a gate and a noise gate is um, is a good term to describe it. Uh, yeah, you could do that with DSP, Peter. I was looking for the mm -hmm. the more common analog yep. thing. There, it's just a gate. Once your signal reaches a certain threshold, it opens up, goes through. Anytime your signal is below that threshold, it kind of mutes it. If you adjust it too high, use it too much, then it sounds like a broke speaker wire or something. So. Well, you get basically the same effect if you run uh, noise reduction too high on your, like in your software. Yeah, because it's, exactly it's doing the a same gating. Sound. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's why I'm saying noise reduction. Yeah. Well, it is a type of noise reduction. Oh, cool. As a matter of fact, you see that unit over there in the rack that's moving with yep. my voice? That's, that's a noise gate up there. Okay. I, I use it in here on my HF rig just to keep. Uh, this air conditioner noise from getting back in, but if I overdo it, it sounds very unnatural, like a, a bad wire or something. Uh, oh, I was I was actually thinking, George, are there microphones where you actually have multiple microphones? One sort of picks up the background noise, the other one picks up you plus the background noise, yeah. and then some circuitry actually subtracts Out of phase. the the background noise. Yeah, it's it's. One of them out of phase with the other. That's a noise counseling mic, and yeah, there's, there mm -hmm. is such a thing there, uh, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sound like that. It's just like the noise is not even there, or, or it's way yeah. attenuated. Yeah, that's so. how your noise canceling headphones work. Yep, that's one of Bob Hiles' tricks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I saw him do that. Yep. So, uh, let's see. All right, now these are definitely radio related right here. 
And I don't know that we've got a question for these. We'll see, because I don't remember what I said here when I recorded them. But uh, let's just listen to these. These are, are something, well, you'd hear with uh, different modes of modulation. A single sideband signal does sound a little narrow compared to uh, a good, clean AM signal or an FM signal. What happens if the frequency of the transmitting or receiving station don't match up exactly? <laughs> if the frequency drifts off in the other direction, this is going lower in frequency, you get to collapse in effect. And I think, you know, the majority of the folks here have experienced that before when tuning in a sideband signal on HF. Um, but those who have never been on HF or never heard sideband before, that's what happens if you now go on a frequency. Now you have, yeah. So that, that's why I played that one, because not everybody here, uh, you know, has heard sideband or experienced it. Um, I don't know what else to say about that one. Fellas? Yep. Okay. How was that? <laughs> Tight underwear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is actually, I have heard that term used for that before. So that's what it sounds <laughs> that's, like. That's not what mine sounds like, but yeah, that's um, <laughs> that's it. All right. Now, so that was on sideband. What about what FM? Pinched, pinched up. What pinched were you up. talking about early? Yeah, pinched underwear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's another one now. This is uh, with FM if the, if the frequency drifts off some. FM signals are immune to many of the types of noise and interference that plague AM and single sideband transmissions. On an FM signal, as frequency starts to drift between the transmitter and the receiver, the pitch does not change. However, when So what I did there is I started out with an FM signal right on frequency. Then I tuned the receiver off a little bit. What did you hear happen, Tommy? I heard it go off frequency and I heard static. Okay. All right, that's, mm -hmm. that's not exactly what I was looking for, but that's kind of what happened. <laughs> well, you said, I'm what did I hear? This, uh, George, capture right. effect. Cap capture effect. Uh, that's not really what I was looking for either, but yeah, that, that was part of it. What would you say, Emil? Mm. That was not a really good demo there. I moved the frequency too much, but uh, what would you say happens if the frequency starts drifting off a little bit on an FM transmitter or receiver? Uh, I don't know. It's mess with deviation, maybe, or um, let's, let's forget, listen. forget the turn. Let's listen to that one more time. Now, it... Granted, I turned it too far. If, if you get off too far, you're just going to lose a signal. But what happens before that signal really gets, uh, gets uncopyable? FM signals are immune to many of the types of noise and interference that plague AM and single sideband transmissions. On an FM signal, as frequency starts to drift between the transmitter and the receiver, the pitch does not change. However, Yep, that's what I was looking for, Tommy. Distortion. distortion. When you start getting a little little off frequency, you'll hear distortion. And you'll hear this a, a lot on repeaters where um, somebody is not exactly right on frequency. And they're mm -hmm. getting into the repeater a little bit, but they just sound distorted. Yeah, I've heard, yeah, I've heard that before. Most cases, that's what it is. The frequency is off a little bit on either the, their transmitter or the repeater's receiver. Cool. Um, all right, and I've got one more here. What if this happened with AM? If the frequency shifted a little bit, what do you think would happen on AM? I'm, I'm going to ask now. Tommy, what do you think would happen to an AM signal if the frequency shifted off a little? Uh, similar. I think it would be some distortion. All right, what do you think, you know? All right, are you going to hear one or the other sidebands, which are kind of the same... Well, yeah, that's a good question, though. Or you might hear that beat, you know, the the, the carrier. I'm not sure what you're uh, looking for, though. I, I have to listen to it. All right. Peter, you got, got anything to add? 
Uh, I think you might hear a heterodyne. Okay. Um, all right, well, let me say this. You won't hear a heterodyne unless there's another carrier there on uh, the same or very close frequency. But all I'm doing here is just I'm just turning the receiver off a little bit, just detuning it a little bit. Okay. Uh, I haven't listened to AM in so long. Yeah, let's listen to what, what <laughs> happened when I did that. With an AM signal, we've got a steady carrier that increases or decreases with modulation. As we begin to change frequencies between the transmitter and the receiver there, we don't notice any pitch change in the signal. We don't really notice distortion picking up significantly. What we notice, though, is the signal begins to fade away as we get further away from the carrier oh. frequency. Till eventually... Oh, yeah. I remember that now from the old AM days, the car just it just sort just of goes fades, away. Fades yeah, away. I, kind of, I, I never listen to AM. I really should do that song, but I, I just never do. Yep. Uh, Marty said signal fade. Yeah, a f shift in frequency could cause that or, you know, a shift in the strength of the <coughs> received signal. But the effect is pretty much That's uh, interesting. pretty similar. Those are pretty neat. Yeah, that's all I had right there, and that's probably enough. Uh, I do have some others I wrote on my list, though, <laughs> that we didn't cover tonight. I don't know if we'll get back to them or not. I'll have to look at the list again and see if they're worth pursuing. It might be, might be neat to do again some other time. Yeah, I just thought it'd be interesting just to see the terms that everybody used for these different sounds. And yeah. if you were trying to describe to somebody over the air what you heard yeah. on their signal. Yeah, that was pretty cool. It was a good idea. How you would do it. Okay, then. Well. It was a little harder than you would think it would be, too. It, it was. Yeah, it was a little bit harder. So, Emil, have you got a post or anything you wanted to talk about tonight? Yes, sir. I have a, um, a Facebook post on our Amateur Logic Forum there uh, from N2QOJ, Joe Sammartino. And yeah, on, back on May 8th, time. he said, hey, today was Teacher Appreciation Day. Thanks to all the Elmers out there that take the time to teach, instruct, share with him to bees, new hams, and all other hams. Your help, you help us to uh, propagate the hobby. And uh, I can personally attest to that, and I'll share that thank you, because there's quite a few Elmers in my club here, the W5SLA club, who've helped me along the way. So thanks a lot. Yeah, but uh, I think we all have, have uh, Elmer's that mm -hmm. have helped us. But, you know, uh, yeah, we have. And, you know, we try to share it on along. And, yeah, absolutely. And with being a professor and a dean on Ham College, nobody sent flowers or chocolates. Or an apple. Or an apple. No. <laughs> Not even a stinking rotten apple, man. <laughs> but, no, um, that was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was a good post there. And well, you know, I think we've about reached the the bottom of the sheet here. That reached really, your limit. <laughs> yeah, all that's allowed by law, you know. So uh, we've enjoyed it tonight. It has been a, another fun show. Thanks to everyone who joined us on the chat room and uh, has has watched live tonight and for those of you who are watching the actual recorded evidence here i'm not sure what i did but it looks like emil got a neck tattoo with his name what oh yeah. look at that yeah yeah nice it's, nice neck tattoo emil it's digitally in, imposed Digital link. So, yeah didn't cost anything i don't even know how to yeah. get rid of it Cheap click, digital click link. down below i think no no on the on skype Hey, watch where you're clicking that thing. Well, <laughs> that didn't really work. So oh, anyway, a uh, couple of things we want to talk about before we go. And I guess, what is the first one, Tommy? Uh, where can we be found? Well, besides right here. Other than right here. Look yeah. for the guy with the neck tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> Or you can find us on all the social media outlets, or not all of them, but uh, the main ones. Amateur Logic, uh, we have a Facebook group, mm -hmm. and we also have a Ham College Facebook group. And, and we also have presence on Google+. Yep. 
uh, both both shows have uh, groups in there as well. And you can follow us on Twitter. The Twitters. At Amateur Logic or at Ham College. Or and at Ham College. You can do one or the other or you, both. You could do you could do that. And what if you forgot if, if you knew we had talked about something before, but you couldn't quite remember where it well, was. You know, Emil, how would you <clears throat> figure that out? Wait. Um I'm thinking that there's a nice volunteer on our crew that does the wiki for us he's awesome and i use it every time to go find a prior episode <laughs> and i think he's talking about our friend dan he is in nine lvs yep yep i hope to see dan and uh dating this time i do too and i hadn't talked to him in a few days so i don't know yeah if if he's coming when he arrives or any of that but i'm yeah i'll be on the sure lookout for him though yeah. for sure appreciate what you do for us on the wiki dan yeah so much appreciated thanks for that well uh thanks everyone who watches and kind of shoves us along keeps us going here it's always fun to get together once a month around the 15th of the month yeah and do a show right here and with all our rowdy friends, of course, Dean Martin. And Professor Thomas. Professor Thomas. <laughs> Peter from Down Under. <laughs> email <laughs> from Pinched Underwear. The, the foreign correspondent. The foreign <laughs> correspondent. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, any final words before we go, Tommy? No. Nope. Uh, hope to see some of you guys in Dayton. And... Uh, if you got the swag, uh, wear it and be sure to stop us and let's get a picture. Yeah. Peter? Uh, nothing much to add. A great show and uh, I will look forward to you seeing you uh, next episode. Sounds like a plan. Email. Hey, uh, I'll have fun in uh, Dayton or Xenia, wherever it is, and then... Um, Seven threes, everybody, and uh, don't forget about field days coming up, right? we got to get that going. That's right. Yeah, yeah, That's definitely. not far. We've been uh, trying to get some tentative plans going. As a matter of fact, we made some during a couple of the commercials here tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. to, so we, we're working on it. That's just next month. So not, yeah. Expect not great away. things. Expect things. Things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Seven three. Yeah, seven three, everybody. See you next time. Seventy three. Seventy three. So here's our first sound. Okay, interestingly enough, that is not what I had queued up that I thought was going to be the first sound tonight. <laughs> uh, let's see if I hit the button again, the right one plays this time. Let's see what this one is. Huh. That seems kind of familiar, <laughs> sounds, does it? Sounds I'm going to go with this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's try this one. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>